Hi, welcome to the Kelly Writer's House. Um, if you are a person who is hunting for a chair, is one appearing for you? Is a, cha a, cha a chair is coming for you? That's great. I'm glad a chair is coming for you. Thank you so much for being here. Whoa, a room full of people. Uh, welcome to the Kelly Writer's House. For any of you, is this your first time here? Wow, that is a lot of people in the Kelly Writer's House for the first time. I feel great about that. I am Davy Niddle. I am the curator of City Planning Poetics. This is my series. Uh, I am so happy to welcome uh, these amazing humans, Max Andrecki and Rachel Levitsky, uh, to the Kelly Writer's House to think about queer placemaking. I'm going to give them a long, gushy introduction. Uh, but I want to do a few housekeeping things first. One, which is to tell you that there's a Q&A afterwards, so ask a question. There's a reception after that, so like have a snack and introduce yourself to someone you've never met. Um, a few other things I want to do, because this is a special moment, is to introduce you all to a person who is in my life uh, via text message more than any other form, which is Sarah Archibauer. Do you want to say hey? Hey, Sarah. Some of you are here because this is the first event in uh, a conference that we are running um, on the poetics of mapping representing the built environment, uh, which is uh, this evening and all day tomorrow. Find one of us if you want more information. Look up the Tumblr, which is mappingthebuiltenvironment.tumblr.com, and come out tomorrow and see a paper, hear the keynote. Uh, we are so lucky to have uh, Dee Morris and Stephen Voice. Um, you want to wave, Dee? Cool. Amazing. Uh, that's tomorrow at 4.30 in the upper gallery in Meyerson Hall. Uh, yeah, so come and do that. I have a huge number of people to thank. Um, I am able to run this program because I have funding from Creative Ventures, and I feel very grateful to be able to do this. Uh, I want to thank Jessica Lowenthal, the director of the Writer's House, who makes this program possible. We can clap for her even though she's not here. Why not? Let's do it. Uh, I want to thank Liz Barr for printing these broadsides. These are extremely gorgeous. Uh, normally they just have the work of a poet or a creative writer, but they have Rachel's work and they have Max's work. So Yay. if you ever wanted a broadside with writing by a geographer, now is your chance. <laughs> cool. Uh, okay, let's do the thing. So I was in a coffee shop last week that often plays long sets of 80s music reading Rachel Levitsky's most recent collection, The Story of My Accident is Ours. The book refuses genre distinction, but it might be a poet's novel. In the book, Rachel models and remodels the emotional and spatial manifestations of activist practice. She describes the energy that sends bodies back out into the city over and over again in an effort to shift it a little or with the belief that maybe a shift could happen. Activism, in the book, is a process of refusal, a process that both generates and destroys collectives. Our best, she writes, keeps us going with some degree of hope, if not calm. Later, she writes, our uncanny confidence in the revolutionary result of a slight shift in the possibilities of our world created both a common space and a sharp division between us. I've loved Rachel's work a long time. Her 2009 book, Neighbor, taught me how to read cities as speculative maps of affect, mine and others mixing in ways I won't ever be able to fully parse. Last week, as I reread the story of my accident as ours, in the coffee shop with the 80s music, Prince's Let's Go Crazy came on. <laughs> And I recalled the lines, in this life, things are much harder than in the afterworld. In this life, you're on your own. For reading Rachel's work, I heard in those lines the fissures that activist process can reveal, but also the hope that it requires, the hope that there could be something else and it's something worth having. I sat in the coffee shop and thought of Prince as a queer icon and of the melancholic response of so many queer folks in my life last year all of us knowing he'd died and being unable to describe what we'd lost. Following Rachel, I'm thinking of Prince on the eve of the anniversary of his death as aspiring to make a queer place. Following Rachel and Prince, I'm thinking of queer placemaking as a process of imagining another way to be in space. 
I'm believing and imagining is a radical process that you do while you wait for a shift to happen. While you wait for a shift, you understand that when it comes, it might hurt equally and differently from what was there before. In an interview with Susie DeFord, Rachel says of her work that it, quote, considers spatial relationships as an ethical field. The spatial relationships in Rachel's writing turn to the fractal spaces of cities, the comfort of looking at a church across the street that you'll never enter, or the strangely public intimacy of seeing your neighbor through their windows, of hearing your neighbor having sex, or seeing them holding a baby or eating a meal. In her work, how the city feels and the spaces that compose it are concentric forms. That union of feeling the city and also moving through it is a queer attention, one attuned to queer bodies and also to urban spaces as queering our expectations of what we think they are. In recent months, it's been in Max Andrecki's work where I felt most guided to new ways of thinking about the queerness of how to model the places where the domestic meets the public. In Max's work, I follow him as he reads for queer experiences of space to demonstrate how the social systems of cities transform over time and how that social transformation in turn shapes the built environment. <clears throat> One of Max's recent projects focuses on queer social reproduction as a means of imagining an urban form of how the social conditions of one generation appear in the next and how queer bodies might remake the frame of all we could expect to see in those subsequent generations. Another of Max's project considers objects in the home as a way of marking queer time in the lives of transmasculine people. A third project applies the practices in feminist geography to the role of white voluntary sector groups in Kenya's transition to independence in 1963. Max and Rachel both model what queer bodies do in and to the city. Both of them invent new spatial forms in order to show those relationships. In his work on queering social reproduction, Max reads how the actions of queer people shape urban space. He describes queer labor as essential to the space of the gay neighborhood, as an organism digesting queer bodies into the fabric of the street, the neighborhood, the city, which, as an aside, is some of the most lyrical writing I've ever seen a geographer do. I think of Max and Rachel as each writing about and into the potentials of queer space. And in their work, I understand queer space to be not just where queer people go, the residences and storefronts and parking spaces they take up, but an alternate mode of thinking about the collisions and compressions that form and reform cities every day. I think of geographer Natalie Oswin's writing on queer space and her call to consider the quote, ways in which a queer approach can be deployed to understand much more than the lives of queers. I think of queer space as in David Harvey's terms to describe ways of thinking about the urban, a general theory of the city, and his assertion that any general theory of the city must somehow relate the social processes in the city to the spatial form which the city assumes. From reading Max and Rachel, I understand spatial form and social process to each show up differently, and thus to require a queer map or a queer, queer written form in order to be together and make sense. I read both Max and Rachel's writing as exercises in a queering of form. Their work suggests that figuring out what cities are and what they might be is a practice that requires formally innovative writing. Max's words changed on the page for me as he lineated them to suit the broadside. Rachel describes the project of her most recent book as a kind of queer form. She says of its sentences, they're quote, easy on the ears and difficult, at least complex, in their thinking. Of her writing more broadly, she said in a 2013 interview with the writer and publisher Lucy Ives, quote, I'm a poet because I interrupt my own prose with poetry, whatever poetry means. In content as well as form, Max and Rachel each read the city for a similar hinge between the home and the public built environment. They each focus on the home as a site of urban production and the neighbor and neighborhood as porous borders between apartment and city, between private and public realms. The city is inherently scalar for both of them, and so they both draw attention to the catalyst that the shift between home and city can be. In their work, so much of urban life is watching people interact with the edges of their homes. As they attend to those edges, Rachel and Max are also both both interested in understanding the role of queers in making space for others and in making others space and finding different things to do with the city and all of its parts. 
In addition to understanding more than the lives of queers, I read in Max and Rachel's writing a queer placemaking that offers a means of reading queerness in all kinds of refusal, and refusal as inherent to how we each make the city by selecting a few parts and putting them together. The which came first problem of urbanism is how to conceptualize what a city is while also trying to figure out what a city is to you. Urbanists have puzzled this out forever, leaving most people out of the city as they conceived of it because they couldn't see them or didn't want to or refuse the fact that they could be seen. Something I love about both Rachel and Max's work is that each of them insists not only on putting queer people at the center of how they view the city, but on imagining a mode of thinking about cities that needs queerness in order to identify what and whom cities contain. Rachel Levitsky is the author of three book-length collections, Under the Sun, Neighbor, and the poetic novella, The Story of My Accident is Ours. She calls her current writing project The Mother of Separation, which she describes as a memoir without memory. She is currently a fellow of LMCC Process Spaces, an open studio project on Governor's Island. She teaches writing at Pratt Institute, Naropa Summer Writing Program, and lay institutions in New York City. In 2009, she was fellow in poetics and poetic practice at the University of Pennsylvania's Center for Programs in Contemporary Writing. Max J. Andrecki is an assistant professor in the Department of Geography and Urban Studies at Temple University. He holds degrees from Leeds University, the University of Vermont, and Columbia University, and is published on sexuality and space, geographies of the body, mobilities, and critical whiteness studies. Also a songwriter, he's a member of long-running indie pop band, The Smittens which is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> he lives in New York City. Join me in welcoming Rachel and Max to the Kelly Writers' House. I should, like, interest first, maybe. Wow, um, thank you so much, Davey and um, Max, and friends, and new friends, and... Um, Al, I was just think I it, it finally dawned on me today, in in the profound way that it dawned on me today, what a radical notion this house is that you walk in as near the poet and then you're like eating a snack in the kitchen with everybody who's making the snack. It really, you know, talk about hard, you know, keeping things lateral, horizontal, and really undoes hierarchies beautifully in a way that suddenly became revealed to me today. So thank you for that. Um, so this is a, a really exciting reading uh, event from an event for me because Davy has sort of unlocked my work, to, my work to me for me, <laughs> uh, in a way that has pretty been pretty astounding. I and I so I went to the archive and I'm gonna. Uh, Hopefully not read over, tw well, I won't read over 20 minutes, I'll stop at 20 minutes, but I didn't time my reading, I'm confessing. Um, but I'm going to take you through a little a journey of um, my queer geographies, I guess, in, in the work I've done. Um, one of the first things I published was uh, a piece from a chat, that what, oh, it was also a chapbook called The Story of, Story of Yaya, The Adventures of Yaya and Grace, and a piece of it got published in this magazine called Clamor, in 1999, and Clamor, it, it, I had met Renee Gladman uh, through Wawin and uh, had sent Renee some of my work, and she was doing this project called Clamor, and, um, and I happily am in it. And her project was to publish queer and people of color um, on the margins in, and to distribute it and to make it beautiful. After she did this project, Clamor, she did this next project, Leroy, um, which then morphed into a perfect bound project called Leanne. And the book that I published with Leroy was called Cartographies of Error. So um, I'm not going to read from Cartographies of Error, but I am going to read the piece in um, Clamor. Uh, and, um, and then I'm going to read uh, from an interview that's in a chat book, but uh, I'll, get, I'll t explain that when I get to it. Um, Okay, so um, I went to Naropa when I was in my 30s, mid-30s. I became a poet late, and I looked around, and I thought, oh, people need coteries, so I'm going to go to get a coterie. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it took a while <laughs> there, but then Carla Harriman showed up, and um, I found, began to find a coterie. 
and um, wrote this. Yaya's Rapture, for and after Carla Harriman. You think, the, the, sorry, the things you think are funny. In a crowded room, books and flies, books fly, one thing at a time, lined up dreams, diminishing orders, primary color codes first, then secondary, then brown, tertiary, pastels, fluorescents, named after birds and Disney movies as far back. The city, until Berlin, Khrushchev wants it now. In the West, feeding their addiction for metaphor, they watch as closely as they can. They believe. They make it religion, craving a national pastime to which they'll all know the tune, humming as mediation, familial, fat, flat-chested, androgene, Amazonian, spandex, and lycra, more washable, evaporates when you sweat. AT&T destroys the last real phone booth on West End Ave. The beginning of a new century, fortuitous, premonitory, still trying to make friends, there we were. Grace loved all the different houses, imagined them as names for her identity. She was incorrect. She couldn't take them along in or outside her skin, then fading, the pores becoming too large, drilling holes into her various parts. By now, conventional. It was the beginning of a new century. Juna, you still alive in there? Do I look like someone with a driver's license? I wanted to touch her. I was sure she could have been the driver and would have let her drive me anywhere. I'd parallel park for her wherever, whenever she got nervous. Instead, I forgot she was there and continued window shopping, inevitably leading me to impulse spending. You could argue I don't need another bottle of perfume. Perhaps Juna watched. She was known to time travel and was expert at being several places at once. Here, the speakers of the language have the hardest time. What to call it, in, on, at, or near. I know I'm fantasizing, and it's not nice to metamorphose an esteemed and ancient woman of modernist letters into a voyeur solely for the sake of my sexual pleasure. Yet how would she know, unless it was true, this is what happened? I could see both the horse-drawn buggies and the helicopters shipping water from anywhere, desalinated as a contrived plea. Forgive us, please, for dumping all that toxic waste. The shit still smells. Every Jew will tell you, th tell you that in great detail, and I can say this because I am one. The reason to hide here, you'd question me either way. Even if she didn't have an issue with Jews, I don't think she'd go for me in any of my stages. She might say my difference was attractive, most certainly in the wee hours. They say it if the hand fits. Well, it fit, and that mattered. It wasn't the chaos we minded. It was that his beauty got us. We no longer needed to argue about the forms. They made attractive envelopes, returned to senders, instructions included. Hopefully it's in your library, this um, <laughs> book. There's a, there's what is, Ariel Goldberg is now turned into a kind of a famous um, editorial note, which is called See Future Issues, as it says, if this were my last issue, and there's a possibility that it is, which it, it was. Um, that's very Renee Gladman. Um, I recommend her to you. So um, let's see. Um, so I, okay. That took exactly as long as I thought it would take. <laughs> so uh, there's an interview book published by Essay Presses, which is doing a bunch of these books with three authors, uh, and they're totally hidden in plain sight on the, in, on the interwebs. Um, and I, did, I spent a lot of time on this and then never told anybody about it and let it be hidden. But, I returned to it today. It seemed perfect to um, for this, and um, I'm going to read my, Andrea Brixilius' first question and my very long answer to it, which is feeds into my current project, Mother of Separation. So Andrea was running the Naropa writing program in this, and so Fred Moten and Omar Barada are the other two people in the three um, uh, of the Braided River chapbook that's at Essay Press. Andrea asks. How has a sense of the rhizome, an interconnected field, energy field that runs horizontally, affected your own writing projects? Do you work with translation, documentation, for example, other voices in the text? How does the work braid together? Me. I am against notions of, of a transcendent self. I was raised into a particular, admittedly peculiar refugee chaos, post-Shoah, Nazi genocide or Holocaust in US American parlance. There, there are complex reasons for using Shoah instead of Holocaust, among them, for my purpose here, precision. My family tells no story, claims no narrative of origin or antecedents, none of those elements which can be fiction or myth, 
but which are told over and over to each other as a means of locating, situating, rationalizing, historicizing. I lack the origin story that might beg for disruption. I am white and work to continuously engage, unpack, disrupt, not take for granted the power of that position, part of which for me means a keen wariness toward appropriating cultures of people of color. And this is in a response to the notion of using other voices. And an attempt to follow POC, people of color leadership. Here I fail, get things wrong, and get back up to try to show up for work again, for the work again. This whiteness is about my body's relationship to power in the world as it is, but not exactly the origin story for which I'm attempting to claim a lack. I don't feel American. I don't feel European. I don't believe in any God and never have. I'm not a mother, and I don't identify in the sense of a feeling state much as a woman, although I really like female parts, pussy, etc., as both something to have and to love. I am not claiming trans identity, even when I am feeling most manly. I am as at home as one might be in my grotesque and confusing female body parts. I say grotesque because I have been raised in misogyny as much as anyone with a cunt and boobs. I say feeling mostly manly because I see in daily encounters that people with whom I interact are confused by it, that odd combination of a feminine shape on top of the less demure, less caretaking, less accommodating ego expression that is expected of and praised in men. I understand that in this world of gendered ego assignments, I may be more of a man than a woman. Critiques of gender and race Identity make perfect sense to me. I hesitate before listing major texts that have represented those critiques for me and that frame popular discourse because I don't want to eclipse an always eclipsed realm, realm of knowledge building and community among genius friends and foes. So much of what shapes my thought and identity is 30 years of being in queer community, being witness to how discourse plays itself out on, in bodies, and vice versa, coming out as a radical lesbian feminist into a butch femme upstate New York scene, as well as my proximity to the emergence of a trans movement with its wild multiplicity of expression ranging from Carrie Edwards' insistence on no gender to playful simultaneities, many gender expressions at once, to a highly medicalized embrace of a more bifurcated masculinity and femininity. Both the range of texts and intimate conversations flood forward. Elizabeth Kennedy and Madeline Davis's major study of working class lesbian culture in Buffalo, Boots of Leather, Slippers of Gold, Gore Vidal's Myra Breckenridge, controversial, of course, uh, Judith Butler's, but important to me when I was 13, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Judith Butler's Gender Trouble, and recently ish, this was written in 2014, um, the, ne the Very Necessary Translation of Testo Junkie by Beatrice Turn Paul Preciado, published by Amy Shoulder when she was at the Feminist Press. I like to name editors whenever I can. Actually, in all my books, I name the editors that publish me in magazines because it's part of the creative making of, a, of our, our knowledge production, and it's uh, often overlooked. But with these major texts, I also want to somehow represent the power of ongoing conversation with Akila Oliver, who also had a birthday this week, yesterday, I think it was, or the day before, the 18th, Tuesday. Um, and so did Kathy Acker, speaking of important queer conversations. Um, when she was in the realm of the shaman, Ricky, and playing with her own gender mutability, and with the brilliant Diana Cage on sex, sexiness, and mobility, and masculinity, and femininity, they both have lots of published work, and I read them as well, but I'm highlighting here the way affect and conversation make knowing happen, happen because you realize something in the physical proximity of connected others, so, simultaneous, so simultaneously feel that your body can move into a knowledge without ceasing to exist. The tradition of transgressive bodies writing and perhaps having to write in a manner that dances between theory, poetry, autobiography, fantasy, and manifesto is both the, tr the tradition and political imperative of my work. I don't find it easy. Lack of an origin story makes me mobile while sitting in place. It does not, however, make me experience myself as alone. Rather, I take the intellect to be in a permanent state of exile, meaning it can commune best with other exiled intellects. 
On the other hand, which is in fact the flip side of the same hand, I have this historically disrupted and refusing to be told story of being a Jew straight out of a particularly Jewish episode in recent bloody 20th century history. My mother is perhaps a classic U.S. American product of a post-Shoah. There is no discussion of the past. When I tried to interview my, my survivor great aunt and uncle while in college, I was shut down absolutely. Anyone with any memory is dead now. In fact, my father had just started to remember and things and to speak fluent Yiddish. It turns out, to my surprise, he, he was fluent. But he died while I was still in the process of revising this essay. Mm, I'm gonna, okay. So I'm going to skip a little bit. Um, my mother's mothering of her children was absolutely affected by the multiple traumas of her birth, early life, continuing ruptures. All that difficulty is identitarian for me. In August 2013, I went to Krefeld, the German town from which my mother had fled with her mother in late December 1939. I suppose I went to see if I would find something of a family story, meaning a story that no one tells. But what we found was an occupation of the Jewish quarter by Ukrainian immigrants who were converted to active Judaism by the Messianic Kavad movement, a global surge of fundamentalist Jews in the US and Europe, perhaps akin to Mormons in Mexico and South America, or Pentecostals in Sub-Saharan Africa. Africa. For many Jews, maintaining a Jewish story in Europe holds a primal psychic power. It's an interestingly non-Zionist, even anti-Zionist fidelity. Some of the Chabad rabbis and their families have sustained repeated anti-Semitic attacks, even murder, for being visibly Jewish in areas in which the last encounter with known Jews was during the Third Reich. The Chabad continue to resurrect decimated communities. Through these migrations and by having many children, they understand themselves to be restoring Jewish populations to the, lo the locations they historically inhabited. Although I recognize that some nationalisms frame revolutionary and anti-colonialist drives and necessities, I am not a nationalist. If actual bodies have little relation to each other, I don't think of them as being a community. However, many Jews do think of all Jews as intimately connected in terms of interests, desires, natalities, in both the dictionary and Arendtian sense. In their work of reoccupying European Jewish communities, it is presumed that the Chabad, or Jewish missionaries, are not actively converting non-Jews to Judaism, because Jewish law is interpreted as being against this thing. That's why if you live in proximity to a Chabad outfit, you've been asked by a bearded man holding holiday-specific religious paraphernalia, like a menorah, Hanukkah, or a lulav, an estrog, are you Jewish? And why you are excluded from the ritual if you say no. However, I recently lost my absolute faith that Jews only seek to convert Jews when I stumbled upon this article, which is hyperlinked, but which talks about Peruvians being converted from Christianity to Judaism to move them to Israel. Crazy article. I was really surprised by it. What I found in Krefeld didn't seed a personal narrative I could build around my mother. I found instead a more sterile story of Jewish state interests and nationalism, albeit in the bodies of Ukrainian Jews who have their own horrific stories of anti-Semitism and historical rupture, who in fact looked something like me. Um, yesterday, two years after that trip, I texted my mother and asked her if she knew what her grandparents did in Krefeld. She texted back, do not know occupation, so, just, occupation. Sorry, I was only two when came to America. Smiley face. <laughs> I am reminded, reinscribed to my belief in exile as my intellectual state. Research into a severed past returns me only to the abyss of the rupture. Akila Oliver's last book, Still in Limbo. Also, Rachel Zoff, who's here, writes on Akila Oliver's work, if, you're, if you have more interest. Um, in finding out. Um, Akila Oliver's last book, Still in Limbo, The Putter's Notebook, or How I Became Strange to Myself, is a long work that reckons exactly with that, the constant search for an identifying story that fails, because all the gestures to locate oneself are met with tragedy and rupture, and the person looking is left alone with a set of gestural interactions of intimate, private, and public self and other, a sentence which is not one. This is from, um, since she died without a will, her her material is sort of in, in limbo, so I like to read her work that's not published as much as possible. This is from chapter six of an earlier and incomplete manuscript of that in limbo book. The line, non-continuous remainder, 
the world a postcard of all black men sitting on folding chairs in front of Brooklyn Brownstone with the caption, My Brooklyn Fourth Annual Photo Plus Essay Contest Exhibition. But looking now, I can see they are not so old, just captured by a lens that condenses a body to a dissipation, to a relic, to a male slot. This tone must have something to do with the not so alive, i.e. dead father. That ends Akilah's part. We, do I mean Akilah and I, invent our stories. We draw ourselves from the edgy language and looks of another. We weave from out of an abyss of discontinuity, death, and other linguistic historical extinctions. We grab hold of relics and icons in, or canons and revolutions. We repeat the terms of our attachment, their lack. Do I use other voices? That was a question. That's my last answer. Do I use other voices? Is there anything else? Um, that was really long. Um, <laughs> but it's my, 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 my 20 minutes aren't yet over, is that okay? <laughs> um, so um, I, I wanted to read that because um, it is what I mean by mother of separation. This, uh, that instead of looking for an origin story that I was interested in seeing how I got, I, how my identity, my queer identity um, is built by the, by the absence and then what's placed in the absence, uh, what I discover, is um, in a queer context what people said said to me in intimate settings, um, and so the, for the last part, so um, for the last part of the reading, um, well, the very last thing I'm going to read, Davy, a, a short poem from Neighbor, but um, I'm going to read um, this the, a couple of poems from this, the other name for um, my future project, current project, Mother of Separation, is Space for Appearance. Um, because uh, of this emerging person that only exists because other people have spoken to them. Um, so uh, they're, they're poems of collected um, experience, like language that has done that. I'll read a couple of those. Oh, and the form of these poems is couplets, and then they end with a reference to a cult, like a movie or a book or something like that. Divines, lack of cognition has been dangerous while mourning, all trauma up front. Asked Brent if he were having another baby, he turned green. The strip had just announced conception, fear, loss in the having of a child. Asked one jokishly amid adorable Antony and his Johnsons and in front of her high style red lipstick lover about her affair with one of the Anselms, shames ever the lesson, both there and lost. English used to be my second language. I didn't text her back, she's cute though. Asked if I were a witch, maybe, maybe not. It's, the, it's not coincidence, but attention, we or one or I can see more with the eye than we or one or I know or say we or one or I know or say we know now I do see guiltily. There are things I can't do because of something I borrowed and broke. No filter. I have none against what's said to me. Max said, sleep with her. Sex difference feminist. On repeat, sex difference feminist as though it keeps meaning something. Maybe it does, the jury, not yet out, repetition. I am loath to it, 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 it. Three times you're mad. Anything you say about it, right till wrong. Okay, Cupid, tell me nearby stories about your addiction girlfriend. Mine, usually addicted too. Young too, practically a minor. Mostly feels bad about the sex work. Is here showing me how, the M how to MDMA, Molly. Amy, Prince says there's joy in repetition, and me, Steinian, insistence, my own impatience. Once you know you do it and it's annoying, please stop. So much fixation, no line outside. Here's one, teetotaling, anxious, yoga twice a day, can't make an autonomous, yes, gesture toward me, and he fears to leave the house before. Pages read, fears to leave the house because too much out there, fears to invite me. Fear of a small town and favoring a small city, 60 million refugees drowning. Sex difference comes back to mind from across several oceans. That disgusting defense against sex difference defiantly opposing my sweetness on her button-down shirt, cropped hair and face, how much I like, why I picked her to begin with. Angry back, not butch, a woman. And for proof, I like to wear miniskirts. May as well have put on lipstick for having said it. Who am I writing for? Who won't get this telling when telling lesbian desire? 
but maybe more um, transcendent how anyone's confusion, concern about what makes a woman a woman, fear of prosthesis, fucks desire in front of us. I slept with sex difference anyway, suggestible, Violet Le Duc. Means, what if I can only write through these stories of love, for isn't it defined by endlessness like communism or weight, and like communism, it holds it together. I tell her she is good at it. I don't say what it means. The pain, the pain I, we moves toward endingly, endlessly. I, we may get something right this time, already added or added back to the music, listening closely to them as it changes, lost it today, could have been that crazy quote unquote medication. It over the counter drives me us out from one container exceeding extremity into another. My, our body, bodies wild with the weary weather, asking pharmacists in fantasy of safe play, forgetful gesturing, innocence, pharmacists are all drug addicts. It is like asking a cop for directions, obedient keystone, suburban, hostile male, more or less trying to contain with brutality that which exceeds their capacity for thinking. I don't know what they think, only how they act. Dominic and Eugene. And um, they go on a little bit. But then I wrote a bunch of them and I didn't know what to do with the form, so I had to start all over again. <laughs> so this is just one page from Neighbor. Basement. 021222. Flood. My phobia around flag begins with neighbor's collection by which any flag will be this room-sized Nazi hung in the basement, conspiracy near laundry done, sex illicitly had, not meaning to harm me, not my fellows, so meaning what? I led him in late one night, I mean to tell, I know this is a confession, the truth, how many chocolates or dangerous sexual partners, the incest with my neighbor, the drugs, the high cholesterol, my embarrassed gender, that I want this to be a novel, everything has to do with the water, the emptiness, the emphasis on the glass. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, uh, Rachel and uh, Davy, for organizing and the extraordinarily generous introduction, and of course, everyone for coming. Um, <clears throat> this is a paper that will appear shortly in a special issue of Society in Space. I'm co-organizing with some friends, including Sarah, um, on the theme Beyond Binaries and Boundaries in Social Reproduction. And by social reproduction, I should make clear I'm referring to life's work, right? All the labor it takes to cook, clean, care, and in so doing, reproduce the labor force. And I've been interested in the theme of queering social reproduction for some time, because I've been wondering you know, for a while, how do queer people's lives and practices fit into the way that, uh, in particular, feminist political economy has conceptualized social reproduction? Right? Uh, of course, the way women's unpaid labor input subsidize the breadwinner wage in industrial capitalism and the related emergence of the heteronormative nuclear family has received a lot of attention as the seeming naturalness of these arrangements has been challenged by feminists tracking women's entrance into the paid labor force. But most attention paid to gay men's, in particular, <clears throat> I'll be focusing on gay men's social reproductive worlds, in particular, has consisted either of um, glib, or one could actually say outright homophobic dismissal, or alternately spectacularization, for instance, of gay dink, right, double income, no kids, couples' use of women's labor as cleaners or as surrogates to bear babies. Discourses which are seemingly not as pointed in reference to lesbians and queer women. Not surprisingly, these images have never felt adequate. Especially in the past two years since the Supreme Court's Obergefell decision, I've kept asking myself why the pleasures and labors of queer intimate life are so often approached through what I consider um, a somewhat reductive lens of homonormativity and how restrictive and really um, devaluing of queer everyday life and its complex spatialities that's felt. As scholars have repeatedly demonstrated, a lot of the influential work on social reproduction focuses on the importance of deprivatizing or socializing the work of social reproduction. For example, organizing collective childcare or even food provision 
like one of my favorite things ever, wartime Britain's rural pie scheme, <clears throat> in which the state provided hot lunchtime pies to male and female agricultural workers toiling in the fields. Dolores Hayden's landmark paper, What Would a Non-Sexist City Be Like, for instance, imagines urban blocks with shared community kitchens, daycare services, and transportation that might actually allow for uh, women's labor force participation on an equal footing to men. But a second strand of the work on social reproduction that's sometimes neglected, and especially, I would argue, by feminist geographers, is the process not just of making links between public and private, but the by necessity public forms of social reproduction. The infinite acts of also gendered unpaid labor that, in fact, make cities run. From William Julius Wilson's problematic peons to collective supervision in poor urban neighborhoods, through recent work on self-help cities in the informal settlements of the developing world, from the well-meaning but intrusive Mrs. Jellybee in Dickens' Bleak House, through to Hillary Clinton's most famous meme, right, it takes a village to raise a child, it's been increasingly clear that, as sociologist Sudhir Venkatesh writes, there is no community in which ongoing collective labor is not required to ensure livability, though the resources available to communities will differ. Revisiting what have seemed, at least for a geographer, like perhaps tired debates about the ontology of gay neighborhoods. Are they in decline? Are they adequately resisting incorporation into regimes of entrepreneurial urbanism? Has, for me, raised the question of not just how they serve as spaces of sociality and political organizing, but also places which are continually performed as queer spaces through the kinds of collective labor that make them tick. So in this talk, I want to think about queering social reproduction through conceptualizing specifically gay men's social reproduction as ongoing collective labor essential to the constitution, not just of gayberhoods, but of urban spaces in general, particularly through the way it might unsettle binaries of public and private that often constrain our thinking around not just intimacy, but caring labor. In reference to paid work, Alan Barabe, um, late historian, <clears throat> perhaps provocatively glosses queer labor as jobs where men do women's work, often in personal service or, quote, decorative, designing, and self-expressive arts. As he notes, jobs that become understood as gay jobs are those in which white gay men perform caring labor in the service sector, and race is central here. As Barabe notes that in the first half of the 20th century, Asian men's labor was very often feminized in the laundries, for instance, but not necessarily homosexualized. And black railway stewards, unlike white cruise ship stewards, were not seen as performing queer labor. It was white gay men's forfeiting of their privileged access to what Heidi Nest calls bodily identification with the machine as phallic substitute that produced for them the specific category of queer work that included, and of course still includes, hairdressers, dressmakers, florists, and flight attendants. Barabee asks, what would we learn if we began to uncover other histories of people who did queer work? How do the traditions of queer work wind their way through our whole economy and social fabric? In this vein, I'd like to ask, what about <clears throat> unpaid labor? Manuel Castells, in his classic work on the Castro from 1983, hints at this question tantalizingly when he notes that the artistic, the artistic talents of many gays have accounted for one of the most beautiful urban renovations known in American cities. The effects on urban aesthetics have gone beyond the careful painting of the original Victorian facades and can be seen in the well-designed treatment of semi-public spaces. Between the front door and the pavement, for example, in all, a very unusual architectural improvement in the highly individualistic world of American cities. Castiglia and Reed, in their book, um, <clears throat> even argue that gay men's camp aesthetic, that bold use of kitsch, to denote an existence outside of heteronormative temporalities, served as one of the originary assaults on the masculinist sterilities of modernism. For Castells, the most important contribution of the gay community to the city, in fact, is, quote, urban meaningfulness. That is, how decisively street life, popular celebrations, and joyful feasts have increased during the 1970s as a direct consequence of the gay presence. Much of the essential work, <clears throat> sorry, much of the essential queer labor being done, I want to suggest, is the performative endeavor of what Chicago School urban sociologist Ernest Burgess called the urban metabolism. In his classic and much critique work, he asks, in what way are individuals incorporated into the life of the city? By what process does a person become an organic part of his society? 
Though for Burgess, the city was an organism that when functioning properly, sort of simply digested newcomers. And he didn't really offer an awful lot of clues as to how specifically this labor was accomplished. Feminists have entered the breach. As planning historian Daphne Spain notes, male professionals built grand boulevards and civic monuments in search of the city beautiful. Female volunteers built the places of everyday life, the neighborhood institutions without which a city is not a city. Municipal housekeeping is Spain's term for the ways in which the links between private lives, public space, and formal politics were made clear by turn of the century women activists and volunteers. <clears throat> so this is from the Women's City Club of Chicago, an image from Daphne Spain's book. You can see how the morphology of Chicago is here mapped out on a series of connections <laughs> between City Hall and homes through the Milk Inspection Department, the Health Department, the Bureau of Contagious Disease, the Marriage License Bureau, and so on. Outside of formal politics, women organized not just, of course, the settlement house movement, quasi-public spaces integrating immigrant women and children into American language, hygiene, and foodways, but also, for instance, educated for public hygiene in the disorderly new cities of industrial capitalism. For instance, the hasty removal, not just of rubbish, but of the bodies of dead horses from the streets where many of these children played. So, <clears throat> I want to use some scenes from the 2008 Gus Van Sant film Milk about the San Francisco po uh, politician Harvey Milk, of course, first openly gay man in the United States to be elected to public office to help us re-envision queer neighborhoods, right? Types of places that Laughlin has famously called neither totally private nor totally public as what Spain refers to as redemptive spaces like settlement houses, right? Um, spaces where family and community making metabolize migrants, incomers, newcomers. So queer labor here is essential, I argue, to the production of the gay neighborhood. In this case, again, the Castro, as an organism in, uh, incorporating queer bodies into the fabric of the street, the neighborhood, and the city. <clears throat> and so I just want to show one short clip from the first half of the film, when Harvey Milk has just begun his first campaign for San Francisco city supervisor. And I should say here, I'm not particularly interested um, in sort of representational questions or the role of film as text per se, but in how this scene and a few others I'll show stills from demonstrate emblematically queer geographies of metabolism. But you register here if you're not registered. Hey, I like the way those pants fit. Where are you from, kid? Um, sorry, old man, not interested. Oh, uh, where's home? Phoenix. Phoenix, come here. Just come here a minute. I'm Harvey Milk. I'm running for supervisor. What's your name? Um, Cleve Jones. Cleve Jones. You're adorable. <laughs> we should we should get you over here and get you registered, Mr. Jones. Fuck that. Elections of any kind are fucking bourgeois affectation. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you do? Trick up on Polk Street? If I need the cash. But I'm a little bit more selective about my clients than you are. Okay, let me ask you one thing before you go back to work. What was it like to be a little queer in Phoenix? Did all the jocks beat you up in gym class? I faked a lung disease to get out of PE. So what? What are you? Some kind of street shrink? Sometimes. But what I'm talking about is that we can change Phoenix. But we have to start with Austria. Um, uh, police abuse, rent control, pot, parks, seniors' issues. Good, good, good luck with all that. Good luck. You know what I think, Cleve Jones? I bet you're gonna get somewhere if you keep talking. No, I think you should do what you do well. You should be a prick. But come with us and be a prick. Fight City Hall, fight the cops. Fight the people that made you come here to do what you do. Sorry, old man, I'm leaving for Spain tomorrow. You're up. All the cash I need is in my back pocket. <clears throat> okay. So Cleve Jones and Harvey Milk's frustrated encounter here on the sidewalk, sidewalk marks a geographic interface, right? not only between public and private space with all the requisite gendered import, but between two obverse embodiments of the possibilities of queer labor. The iconic gay male politician, the mayor of Castro Street, and Cleve, the young migrant to the city, the radical poser, 
and sex worker in the seedier, racialized, pre-Stonewall gay neighborhood of the Tenderloin up on Polk Street, who continually refuses, mocks, and subverts Milk's exhortations to register to vote and join the masculine order of formal politics. I want to suggest that mediating this encounter on the boundary is queer labor <clears throat> because it's been <clears throat> because of how it's been produced as women's work. Anne McClintock, writing of the pornotropical trope in the colonial imagination, notes that, quote, women served as mediating and threshold figures by means of which men oriented themselves in space as a means to contain both their sexualized megalomania and paranoia. The feminized figure as boundary marker evinces both, quote, a simultaneous dread of catastrophic boundary loss associated with fears of impotence and infantilization and attended by an excess of boundary order and fantasies of unlimited power. The gendered work of superintending threshold crossing continues to be an important theme in at least two more scenes in the film. Years after the initial encounter with Cleve, Milk again finds him on his doorstep after a breakup. Milk himself arrives at his door, running in fear of the threat of a gay bashing taking place on the nighttime street. The encounter itself serves as Cleve's sort of come to Jesus moment, an immediate precursor to a longer conversation in which Cleve is incorporated into Milk's political team as soon as he walks through the door and goes upstairs into Milk's private space, the apartment above his storefront. Next. Later on, Milk first makes eye contact with his new lover, Jack, as Jack stares into his storefront window from the outside. Drunk and unable to stand up, he's here, another beautiful lost child, taken in by Milk. This time his crossing the threshold is a precursor to a lovemaking scene and eventually a stormy relationship that culminates in Jack's suicide not long before Milk's own assassination at the hands of Dan White. I've been thinking about how these threshold crossing scenes work in tension, public-private links making, demonstrating Milk's singular role at the center of two very well-documented forms of prefigurative and performative queer community making, local politics and sex cultures. The latter calls to mind, of course, Bersani's devastating critique of the frequently circulated claim that the bathhouse with its racial and physiognomic pecking order could ever be some sort of uh, site of Whitmanesque democracy. But also the ways in which, in San Francisco in 1984, the local state, in the form of the city's public health director, Mervyn Silverman, shut down 14 bathhouses and sex clubs catering to gay men. The work of urban metabolism here is constituting not just a set of spatial crossings, but also a queering of high and low an insistence on multiple embodied as well as cognitive registers of queer caretaking and world-making within the microcosm of the gayborhood in a city in the midst of one crisis of homophobic violence and on the verge of another one much, much worse. <clears throat> but if the turn of the century women's work redeemed the industrial city for everyone, why can't we think of queer social reproduction that way too? So to this end, the second sort of empirical case I want to discuss comes from the work of an organization, Bridgemen, which is a social program of the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, which in fact was co-founded by Cleve Jones. Bridgemen's mission states that it is, quote, for gay, bi, and trans guys who are looking to give back to our community. We organize fun and relevant community service projects and social events that provide leadership opportunities and create friendships. Our goal is to make San Francisco a safe and happy place for everyone. Ultimately, this dovetails with SFAF's goals in preventing the transmission of HIV AIDS. So volunteering men, connected men, happy men, healthy city. And here are two examples of what they do from their website. <clears throat> Josh helped plant trees at a community garden. And Dominic helped clean up Ocean Beach. Key here, of course, is the choice of humor, right? Both the puns, trimming bush and getting wet, clearly alluding to the female body, metonymically feminizing this collective care labor being performed on the borders of the city at large. So what are the stakes of thinking about queer labor as redeeming the gayborhood? As John D'Amelio notes in his classic essay, Capitalism and Gay Identity, which I make a point of reading like every six months, the building... <laughs> 
and there's always more in it. The building of an affectional community must be as much a part of our political movement as our campaigns for civil rights. Thinking about forms of queer organizing, not just under the rubric of politics, much less service provision, but as labor, unpaid labor, I would argue raises the stakes as we can think about the relationship between care and placemaking and the mystification and devalorization of gendered forms of quote, ongoing collective labor. Queering social reproduction, I argue, then becomes a question not just of making visible, but of rearticulating the value of feminist care, uh, feminine, feminized caring labor in public space. And sometimes that means women's labor as performed by men. The racialized nature of queer labor's history, of course, posits a caveat to any kind of utopian thinking. As Johan Anderson has made clear in his recent work on New York's West Village, well-to-do white gay men's collective labor of eyes on the street can and often is used to remove younger, poorer, blacker, and browner bodies from queer urban space. And Ray Rosenberg has very recently made a similar point about the criminalization and marginalization of queer and trans young people of color, even by youth social service providers in Chicago's Boys Town. But as Spain notes, 100 years ago, it really wasn't only middle class white ladies redeeming the city. The Salvation Army and the National Association of Colored Women, among others, were working class led voluntary organizations. So I'm a bit of enough of a utopian thinker to believe that prefiguring the very production of cross class and cross racial alliances can itself be a task on the gay agenda. <clears throat> Heidi Nast poses a binary of responses to the reconfiguration and sidelining of sexual reproduction in the late capitalist rich world. She asks, Will the libidinal energies once directed towards procreation be subjectively redirected inward through narcissistic and alienated forms of recreational sex and consumption? Or can intersubjective erotic caregiving be mobilized, radicalized, and redirected outward to comfort and sustain more marginalized others? Well, perhaps we don't need to choose, but we can valorize a queerer form of social reproduction that operates on the threshold between recreational sex and erotic caregiving by creating semi-public spaces of sexual and social potential, we can in some sense save the city from the modernist spatial division of functions which relegated sexuality to interiors and social reproduction to the periphery. So I wanna keep insisting on gay men's and of course other LGBTQIA contributions to the suite of contemporary crises in which cities find themselves. To think how queer forms of social reproduction might offer redemption and challenge market logics in urban spaces like contemporary New York, San Francisco, I mean, and of course, Philadelphia. In this sense, I want to push past both the romanticization of autonomous separatism and the reduction of voluntary labor to its role in neoliberal responsabilization of the self. Maybe we can also then move beyond binaries of radical queer and assimilationist gay to recover the emancipatory potential in social domesticities and the labor it takes to maintain our cities. Or like it says on the wonderful broadside, which I'm now calling my latest publication. Um, <laughs> by queering social reproduction, let us unsettle all those logics that haunt the ever more unequal city. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you both so much. So we're now gonna open it up to questions. There is a traveling microphone. So uh, if you'd like to ask a question, um, signal that you have the desire to do so and Caitlin will give you the mic. Something about crossing thresholds 
um, that changes for you your ideas or, or what it sparks for you um, in terms of what you think about the way cells, bodies get shaped by the city, mm -hmm. how spaces get shaped by the passage of those thresholds, if that's come up in your work at all. One of my students has a character that is the messenger, and the messenger goes through walls hmm. and other barriers. And until the messenger figures, gets good at her job, no, it's a they, until the messenger gets good at their job, they keep on ending up with like burns on their periphery through the threshold. That's the first thought I had about that. Um, in other words, which, right, I think your paper so much address that there's these ever, that we're ever accommodating these increasingly these, um, daunting, I've been calling it high high capitalism lately. Mm. Um, um, high global capitalism. It's a little bit higher to it. Um, so, uh, that that there's that every time we shift into figuring out again how to do the work we do, mm. there's a bit of a bruise, mm -hmm. right, or a wound of some sort. Like we might feel it on our body. We get a rash. Get stomach ache. <laughs> like I think it's really physical that those new thresholds. Mm. Um, I was wondering if both of you, not at the same time, but one after the other, um, or at the same time, that would be great as well. Um, could talk about refusal. Um, it's something that I've been thinking a lot of about since a class that Davey and I are both in, we're talking about refusal. Is, is, is refusal temporally, like, finite? Is it a moment? Or is it something gradual that happens over and over again in sort of imperceptibly, like, in a you know, continuous way? Or is it both? And how does that work for both of you? Um. In my answer, I, mean, I want you to answer first, because in my answer, I have a question. <laughs> I don't. Uh, when you talk about refusal, are you talking about sort of refusing heteronormativity or refusing capitalist logics? Or I'm thinking of it in terms of very much in terms of capitalist logics, right? In refusing to either, like in your closing remarks, right? You're talking about like we don't need mm. to necessarily all go to this radical queer mod, mod, mode of refusing assimilation, mm. right? Mm -hmm. I guess I could focus it in more on that, right? Is that refusal, where does refusal go from then? <clears throat> go from there, sorry. And how do we use it as a radical tool still? Um, you know, I think it's both refusal and engagement, right? And I think that a lot of scholars have been maybe trying to move past the maybe decade old now sort of antisocial turn in queer theory, which is primarily based upon refusal, refusal of futurity, right? Um, withdrawal from um, sort of intersubjective erotic engagement, that kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, I think of it as, of course, in some sense, an act of refusal of what confronts one, and you can't walk around Philadelphia you really can't walk around San Francisco and not, I can't, um, and not feel a profound sense of disgust, but that refusal is only to be, I know that's a bit glib, but it's very pretty. But, <clears throat> um, the, the sort of un unbelievable, I mean, in unfathomable levels of inequality that you see as sort of clearly being produced out of this neoliberal moment and specifically in these cities which are sort of um, scripted as cities at the sort of forefront of um, automation and innovative capitalism and this kind of thing. So anyway, one can't refuse the one can't refuse the present without sort of digging in and engaging. And so to me, I guess if you're asking it about a temporality, that it's continuous, right? In the sense that all life making is continuous work, right? Every day it's work, right? Um, and in that sense, I think 
refusal at the scale of the urban for queer and all sorts of other communities, refusal has to be that kind of um, investment in, I think, multiple forms of simultaneous temporality, really. So I, um, I was thinking about humor. When you were talking, reading your paper, I um, was thinking that I'd been watching Mary Tyler Moore shows again when I bought the first season mm -hmm. because I haven't yet refused Amazon because it's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I tried, I tried. Um, but anyway, and it's daunting. <clears throat> I, mean, I read it, I watched it as a child. It's daunting how much the humor depends on the gay joke. And, and on sure. my, I, I, it's, I mean, so I, I, so I was sort of thinking about like the labor of providing the, the humor of the city, right? One of the things I, yes. I, I, I think of um, is um, when I was in Germany, I was, I never meant to go to Germany. All of a sudden I was in Germany. <laughs> and I, I was like, how did I, what, what happened to make me be in Germany? Anyway, I, 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 I found it not funny. And I thought, wow, they, in a way, I mean, there are spaces of, of humor in immigrant communities, but I, I was like, wow, what, what, what level of humor was just decimated when, they dec when the Jewish population was decimated, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and so uh, I find humor, my humor, or, and the humor I like, to be a space of refusing homogeneity in general. So um, I was wondering if you wanted to, and then it's weird because then it gets, that it gets exploited, right, by not funny yeah. people. Well, yeah. <laughs> like not funny straight environments that like don't, don't have enough of that, like right. don't have enough of that refusal, like go to. I think most pointedly of Are You Being Served? Did anyone used to watch that on PBS? Yeah. Uh, I, the camp, the camp, British camp. Uh, yeah, I didn't watch it. Um, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about, I don't know, if humor, if we can call the camp aesthetic or kitsch aesthetic a form of design humor, but I mean, I, it's often displayed, it's I often would. playfulness, but like I, like I noted in the paper. Um, I mean, it's certainly one of its, <clears throat> it maybe an umbrella to many things and humor, sure. yeah. Um, that it posits the subject as um, not of this time, right? Um, and so the continuous use of the throwback or that mm -hmm. which is outmoded mm -hmm. as a form of self-presentation mm -hmm. um, obviously is essential to sort of at least a certain strain of gay male aesthetic production throughout the 20th century. Um, right. And so I also think, yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say about those TV programs that send <laughs> up Camp Humor. I mean, I think that there's all sorts of ways in which well, it's queer all, it's aesthetics like all... and in fact um, you know black or African American aesthetics uh -huh. are bubbling uh, are bubbling through um, and being appropriated and um, permeating into um, sort of standard forms of discourse um, right. which to me is always a marker of the sort of ultimate unassimilability of race and of queerness into um into, into mm -hmm. liberalism mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. um, in late capitalism. And mm -hmm. so it always has to perform its own otherness through actually um, mm -hmm. recuperating that and in some ways spectacularizing it. And that's, mm. that's maybe the way that I have lately thought about it a little bit. Um, yeah, I guess those slides are funny. You know, I read them and I was like, this is, I, I, I don't know, maybe I'm not. I have a sense of humor, but I was kind of like, these are amazing, these images, but I didn't think of them for the kind of humor that they perform and what that's particularly doing. Uh, I, was, I was, as you were speaking, I was thinking, one of the, but it's not the, only does it resist homogeneity, it doesn't just res, it, it resists the limit, right, of the sense of continual progress into one thing. And what you were talking about, um, being also retrograde or like, mm. right? Like it, 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 that humor insists that history actually is bigger than the moment. Right. Yes. That we're in. That we that we're small in in the bigger scheme of things. Absolutely. It it, it operates like that. 
let's not take this too seriously, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, which is a refusal, but yes. you know, so one can refuse and laugh. Yeah. Um, yeah, I need to think more about that, I think. Um, of course, there's been so much ink spilled about gay humor, camp humor. Um, I don't need to hold forth on that. But, um, in terms <laughs> of the way that it gets about, incorporated. In terms of lab, yeah. as like city labor, like I was like, I, I, yeah, I just was curious about it as a yeah. possible, you know, like Humor space or like I still sort of notice sort of joyousness or um, um, the, I, the sort of carnivalesque. Uh -huh. Right, and that what queers bring to the sort of stultifying mar uh, modernist mm -hmm. city is a sense of of the carnivalesque, and in that sense, the spark of possibility that is sort of at the essence of you know that sort of nineteenth century Paris understanding of what urban space could or should be. Right, and yeah. it's always serious humor, right, because it's humor of resistance. Also, mm. I mean, not always, maybe, but I'm thinking about a lot of those spaces are all also pu like, ru rupturing. What do you mean? Well, I'm just thinking about, I, I guess what occurred to me was Circus Amok. Did, did you, have mm -hmm. you followed Circus Amok? Jennifer Miller's um, very queer, very um, diverse, very politicized political theater that she, do, that she does in, um, for 20 some odd years in parks in New York City. And they always take on a, a, a burning, they did a stop and frisk one, and they did. Okay. So there's all this politics mm -hmm. and human. And, there's also a connection to freak show, so there's a very direct labor of both educating and making fun of. And, uh, yeah, I think and that's that, that's we earn space sometimes. How to is that we earn space by by agreeing to be the clown or to be the jester or some. Um, someone. Yes, but I think let us not forget that work is work. That's what I'm think, saying. Yeah. That I'm, I'm I'm pointing to it as work. Hmm. That, what do you mean that work is work? I'm saying that that's a late, like it seems like a labor to me. The being funny, the making ridiculous. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Maybe take two more questions. In that vein of taking on clowning as labor, um, could it even be, say, to be taking on a certain Saturnalian role? Like, um, of creating a topsy-turvy space and like queering space, but adding humor to it to make it more easily dismissed and embraced at the same time for everyone's enjoyment, mm -hmm. to like that, that kind of jester role? Maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, like, if that... That's certainly what's happening on Mary, Mary Tyler Moore. <laughs> <laughs> Fair, yeah. <laughs> that's my whole question. Yeah, I think that's what's happening, but I... I I guess I want to hold on to the ways in which that can that serves as an entree or a way of framing that which is really sort of material labor in, in all sorts of mm -hmm. ways which um, often become drudgery, right? So that we need not erupt into flights of fancy over how um, making things humorous or making things ridiculous will actually do the work of cleaning up a park, right? Mm -hmm. Or cleaning up a beach, right? Especially when the city and the state won't. Right, or taking care of our elderly, right? Or taking care yeah. of our children or our runaways or, yeah. You know, that group Sage, right? You know Sage in there? Um, so Max, when you're speaking, I couldn't help but think of what's been going on here in Philly. Like, I know you teach in Philly, I know you don't live here, but, but around the neighborhood, in terms of the black and brown workers' collectives, um, um, protesting in front of eye candy and the, 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 the clubs in the neighborhood and protesting at the Mazzoni Clinic, the, the queer clinic, um, around um, certain rules, like rules in the clubs that you can't wear Timberland boots. Um, I think that you, I think there was one about hoodies um, and this kind of um, ongoing segregation that's happening in cities like like this that that is um, is a lot about labor and it's a lot about uh, how do you, how do you take care of mm -hmm. of everyone so I wonder if you could comment on it a bit if you know if you know about it if you don't know about it it's fine I know a bit about it um, and 
I think it says a lot about the way that we are so inclined to view gay neighborhoods as um, static places, but the way in which these activists um, sort of digging in and, 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 and providing their obviously unpaid labor to make change shows that these places can be made and remade, of course, notwithstanding property relations, of course, notwithstanding class relations. But it seems to me that you could take an analysis of that situation in two ways. One, right, is that the neighborhood here, or neighborhoods in general in American or Western cities, are irredeemably bound up in, in white supremacy and class oppression. Or you can take it in a different direction, right, which is to think that this space is to a significant extent open to being performed and reperformed um, through activism, uh, you know, through visibility, through um, journalism, through making clear uh, acts of overt and covert racism. Um, and that that sort of itself is a spark of potential that shows us what sort of investing can actually do to recuperate places which are always going to be um, problematic in certain ways, are always going to be partial in terms of the needs that they offer to identity formation or to um, those who go there seeking whatever they seek, right? But I suppose I think of that, and I did sort of confess in the paper I might be a bit of a utopian, but I sort of think of that as a way of investing in um, the sort of openness of the future rather than it being foreclosed by sort of structural forces which smother us. We can thank Max and Rachel one last time. <laughs>